We are so sorry, but we missed the first 10 minutes of this recording. We have provided the transcript of the missing portion in the description below. Thank you for understanding, and please enjoy the panel. Advancing Leadership. Not only did you answer the question, Alice, but since you talk about brilliance, this might be a good time to bring in Sky to the conversation because uh, uh, Sky's chapter, uh, Sky's essay rather, is in the second part of the book. It's called Beginning. And uh, Sky, you also talk a lot about representation, but you talk about representation with your clothing line, uh, which is called Rebirth Garments. And, and you use Rebirth Garments to communicate a message around, around radical visibility. And I wonder if you could share with us how that clothing line got started and what you are doing with that clothing line. Yeah, thank you. This is Sky speaking, and I'll give you all a d description of what I look like. I'm a petite Filipinx tan person with a lot of tattoos. I have a spiky geometric eyeliner and an asymmetrical blue lip. I have on my head a scale male headpiece in pink, purple, teal, and yellow. Uh, and it's very uh, stimmy and you can maybe hear it. Um, so that helps me with calming myself down. I'm wearing a color blocked crop top um, and it has sheer parts that can reveal some of my tattoos. I'm wearing a chainmail necklace uh, that's like chainmail out of chainmail. All of these uh, items that I'm wearing, I, I've made. Uh, I have earrings that are in the shape of the queer crip symbol that I created, which m mishmashes the new accessible uh, accessibility icon with the trans symbol. And these were uh, collaborative earrings laser cut by my friend Alex Chen. I'm also wearing a posture harness by my friend Emma Alamo um, that I wear all the time so that I can um, have less back pain, um, but it's pretty cool. In the back, uh, it has a lot of hardware. And I am non-binary, so I have a they, them pronoun button, and I have a button that says, hello, I am prone to panic attacks. Um, and I'm wearing a necklace that says Access Bitch, which is the name of a song that I created and that I really believe that uh, Alice Wong is one of the, uh, the you know, Access Bitches of the world. So. <laughs> um, so yeah, I started my clothing line in 2014 and I wrote this manifesto that has a abridged version in, uh, in Disability Visibility Anthology in 2015. So it was all kind of around the same time that Alice started the Disability Visibility Project. And right when I was finishing up writing my manifesto, I saw, like, that's when I discovered Alice's work, uh, which was very exciting to me because to see uh, an Asian American, like, woman who is, like, super amazing activist and disabled was just like just super exciting because I hardly ever saw any Asian representation in in media or anything really growing up um, besides like martial arts films <laughs> um, and yeah so I started this clothing line a bit after uh, my stomach kind of stopped working very well in college um, I've always been a disabled person. I, I'm neurodivergent and I've had anxiety and panic disorder and depression my whole life. Um, and, you know, I've just added to the mental, the list of mental illnesses since then. Um, but when the stomach disorder happened, it, uh, you know, it was kind of like my anxiety had turned very physical, um, and I stopped being able to wear pants that were like jeans or what I call uh, quote unquote hard pants um, because the, the waistband would just make me feel really, really sick. So I started the clothing line um, thinking that I would do two separate clothing lines, one for people with disabilities and then a lingerie line for 
uh, trans and gender non-conforming folks where it would all be gender affirming um, garments like chest binders and tucking undies and packing undies. But then when I was actually working on the prototypes for the clothing, I decided that I should actually just make this clothing line be one thing and just talk about the the intersectionality of of everybody so that people could have a clothing line that fully re represented them no matter what their uh, their gender expression or their race or sexual identity uh, or disability or size or age was. Thank you, Sky. This, this conversation is part of ADA 25 Advancing Leadership's Power Series. And uh, your fashion, for, for those of us who can see you, is, is amazing and colorful and brilliant. And the fact that you came to this is a reminder that many of, many of us who live with disabilities, uh, and I, I, think, um, I think Alice talks about it in her introduction, she says, just allowing ourselves to the vulnerability of being visible is a radical act. And so for you to describe yourself as uh, non-binary and disabled and everything that you just named, many of us uh, work really hard to hide those things and shut ourselves down. And you clearly have been able to live into your power. And I wonder for those of us who might be listening, who are struggling with finding our own power, what advice would you give? What sources do you use to give yourself that power. And I'm sure it's not constant, I'm sure it's not every day, but you have managed clearly to live into your power. And what lessons can you, can you share with us to help us do that, to model that kind of grasping of power? I guess, oh, this is Sky speaking. I have heard a lot from people that they feel like no matter what their identity is, whenever they see my clothing, they'll be like, oh, I could never pull that off. And then I always say, of course you can. Anybody can pull off anything. Or they say that they're too old for it, which I'm just like, you're being ageist against yourself. Like, wow, <laughs> why would you say that? Um, I guess the way that I started to come into my power as a disabled person is like just from in my childhood, having panic attacks every day at school, I, like, so I, I am not apparently disabled to most people, uh, except for when I'm having a panic attack, and um, luckily, I have them more under control, because now I have a lot more autonomy, so, you know, I get to dictate whatever I want to do. I think autonomy is the thing that gave me the most strength um, whatever that means to you. So um, part of it is, you know, getting to decide what to dress for me, but also just having, you know, to not having to go to school anymore. Like school was a huge thing that um, I feel like kept my autonomy away from me. Um, but yeah, so I would have panic attacks all the time in school. And I remember my eighth grade teacher one time setting me aside and saying like, you will not be able to do this in high school. Like you won't have your mom to run to because my mom subbed um, in the grade school that I went to. Like you, you won't be able to do this. You're gonna have to get over this. Um, but little did she know that I would find an art teacher at my high school who became like my second mom. So I could just keep on doing it. So I think uh, trying to, ignore the people in your life who say that you can't um that the way that you are acting is like unacceptable um when it like i mean i wasn't hurting anybody i was just uh just my nervous system was just so disturbed all the time when i was a kid um and i i guess yeah because of not being able to hide it then I decided to embrace it. But it took a long time. Like I, I was having panic attacks every day when I was tw 20 or, or 21. And my partner at the time broke up with me um, because of my panic attacks. Um, and so then after that, I decided to have 
uh, a rebirthing ceremony, which is why my clothing line is called Rebirth. Um, I, I had just met like a really amazing neurodivergent, like openly schizophrenic uh, artist who like everybody really respected um, named Heather Lynn. And I was working on her sci-fi feminist uh, space opera, co helping costume it. And after meeting all these amazing strong ladies and queers who embrace their like neurodivergencies, I decided to have this um, kind of art ceremony um, that I called a rebirthing ceremony where I decided that I wouldn't let my anxiety kind of like bring me down and instead I would channel it into my work and my life. And so I think there's like a quote that's like, um, I, a trigger warning, like suicide talk, but just for a second, uh, there's a quote that says like, I kill myself in order to not die. Like, I think it's from Kate Bornstein. Um, so like, that was my way of killing off part of me in order, like the part that, where my anxiety wasn't helping me and where I was letting outward society um, kind of bring me down because they were saying that it was an that it was unacceptable and just killing that part off and being like, no, this is acceptable and this is who I am. And yet, as Alice said a few moments ago, even with all of that, we still live in a world that privileges able-bodied people. How do you sustain that, Sky? Well, since I am, you know, seen more as able-bodied and I, I pass as able-bodied, but so I have more of a problem with them. Um, you know, pass, passing as sane and uh, and thinking about uh, also the how it um, how the world you know favors sanity always and uh, how you know people of color, uh, women, gender variant folks um, like we've all had to be you know I mean physically disabled and. Uh, folks with other kind of disabilities like we we're all set to the standard of of like Eurocentric white um, able-bodied able-mindedness and um, I guess I wait sorry I lost my train of thought but it's like okay. I, yeah you and you were talking about passing I was I was thinking about I think we had this conversation earlier it really resonates with me I think as, as people of color, as people who are queer, as people who are non-binary, as people who are disabled, that notion of passing is always with us. You talk a lot about that in your, in your essay, in the book about your, your, your very strong thoughts about passing. Yeah. Uh, could you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, this is Sky talking again. And I, yeah, I am very anti-passing because, and that's what being radically visible is all about is making sure that we are taking up space visually and physically in the world so that people cannot ignore us because most of the typical clothing for disabled folks is very unesthetic and just like, yeah, it just makes you feel horrible. It looks like scrubs. It looks like, um, yeah, it just, it just like pathologizes you. Um, and yeah, so I'm anti-passing because I think if, you know, if we didn't all have the pressure to pass and stay with this, uh, you know, these idealized standards that are Eurocentric, then, you know, then the world would be a lot better. Like we would all be able to just like live our lives a lot more comfortably if if people weren't always just trying to force us to, to conform to these ideals. Like I, I live in a very nice bubble where I, I can be whoever I want and like my friends around me, we can all be whoever we want. And like, it just, it's just so much better. And it, it feels like the queer crip utopia that I dream about all the time and I'm trying to create. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to go back to you, Alice, and ask you about this question around, around power because you have assembled um, a number of very powerful a very powerful essays and a couple of them I went back to a couple of times and it was clear that you had very strong feelings about including these 
these very powerful voices in terms of people struggling with living into their power and what to do with that power once I receive it. Can you talk about your perspective on how you chose the essays that you chose and what, what particular messages you were trying to communicate to the readers? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, this is the privilege of being an editor for over for many years. I've collected various stories and, you know, bookmarked them on my web browser. And, you know, over time, it's been a pretty huge collection. And I wanted it to be a cross-section of things that were powerful personal and political and you know I may not have written these things but I think it's because these people it's the 37 contributors are writing it, their stories in ways that are just far better than anything I could attempt and the fact that they're talking about their lives on their own terms unapologetically is something that's is really beautiful and I wanted it to be, you know, centered on the wisdom of disabled people and really, you know, uh, there's a intention behind the kind of topics that are important to me, uh, you know, for example, reproductive justice, uh, just I mentioned autonomy, bodily autonomy is huge. Uh, there's things about science, there's a piece about uh, you know, uh, violence, there's a piece about disability justice, there's a, there's a lot of work that's also grounded in the lived experience. And again, this is also this leads to my own pet peeve about some of the things that are out there is that, yeah, there's, you know, representation, but there's a lot of kind of, in my opinion, mediocre representation. And I love to be like picky. I have my favorites. I have things that I think everyone should know more about. And this is kind of my attempt to, to really put a spotlight on these 37 individuals. It's really less about be the individual, but us collectively as a, as a series. And I think uh, it doesn't tell this grand narrative, but there is something hopefully for everyone. And I just love the fact that it's so, uh, there's such a variety, there's such styles, there's so many different cultures and backgrounds that you really can't deny that this is really the tip of the iceberg. And I think that's, you know, the real kind of agenda that I want to, you know, kind of advance is that this, if you, you know, if this was your first experience, kind of diving deep into what you think of, what disability culture is, this is just a tip, you know, just this iceberg. Yeah, thank you, Alice. I found one of the most fascinating things about the essays was that, uh, every essay was new and exciting, and I, I found myself just being surprised at every turn. I, I wonder what you learned from compiling these essays and reading these essays. I mean, you are one of the most uh, learned, uh, one of the le learned um, uh, speakers and writers in the disabled community in the country in general. I wonder what you learned that surprised you as you were putting these essays together. Uh, first of all, I don't know if I've really that learned it. I think at the heart of what I do is it's really grounded in love. I mean, that sounds so cheesy, right? But I think that's really true. Like, I'm a fan. I think at the heart of what I do with my podcasts, with my blog, with, you know, the Twitter chats, and my experiences being online with other disabled people, it's really just you know, hyping each other and having this mutual love fest, which I think we all have it right now. I know that during our prep, uh, our prep meeting, we were all kind of, you know, gushing about each other because 
factors. You know, I think we do know that as disabled people that we don't come together enough and that when we do, there's a real badge. Like there is real power. You know, talking about the theme of this uh, series, there is real power with disabled people get together. I think that's really, really evident in my own life, in my own experiences. And I think this is also true for this anthology is that, wow, like, you know, this is quite a, a tight kind of curated collection. And I think it's just chock full of power. And I think that gives me joy. And I talked a lot about joy and the introduction of my book. And I think that's what drives me. You know, it doesn't give me joy. And if it doesn't give me joy, maybe I don't want to spend my time on this. Maybe I don't want to spend my energy on this. So I really want to, I want all of us to be immersed in one another's joy and abundance. And I think that's, that's the spirit in which I created this book, and I hope that people feel that vibe when they're going through it, whether whether they read the whole thing or not. Just uh, you know, read through a, a few pieces. Uh, I hope they come away with that. Thank you, thank you. So, everyone, in a few moments, again, this is Derek Dawson speaking. In a few moments, we're going to open up to your questions, and so this is just a reminder to go into the Q and A and uh, add your questions so that we can uh, address those in a moment. My last question though is to you, Sky, and I want to ask you, as Alice just talked about what gives her joy, and, uh, and, and I, I'd love if you could share what gives you joy in your work with your fashion line. What gives you joy, Sky? So this is Sky speaking. I, I get so much joy from my models and from the people that I work with. Uh, just being able to, you know, really interview them very in depth and get to know what would kind of create their most dreamy, accessible, and like gender affirming garment. And then getting to create that and see the look on their face or like just their, how their attitude shifts, like their whole confidence might um, completely change like in front of my eyes and uh, like I've heard people who have said before that like, you know, they were like kind of desperate to get top surgery or, or bottom surgery or something like that. But being able to find uh, like fun and cute gender affirming uh, lingerie made it so that they didn't felt necessarily feel the pressure to get that. Whereas before they felt very pressured by society. And, you know, I think everybody should get whatever surgery that they want that is gender affirming but I think it's really magical that um that just my clothing could make it so that they felt affirmed enough in their body that they um that they don't necessarily feel the need because that's kind of how I felt like when I was uh in high school and getting kind of interested in chest binding and things like that but through being able to make my own clothing, I don't even really find it necessary to, to chest bind um, because I feel comfy. Um, so yeah, I just like, I love my models. I love, I love uh, seeing people wear my clothing and get joy from that. And, and I also really do en enjoy the act of, of, of making, I mean, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't do it if I, I didn't love making clothing. Uh, it's it's another thing that helps calm my brain. Um, but e even though I know it does stress me out sometimes when I have literally 500 orders. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, <laughs> you can handle this guy. And tell us again what the name of your clothing line is. It is Rebirth Garments. And you can follow me on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter at Rebirth Garments and on Facebook um, at Rebirth Garments with the word separate. Um, I am newly TikTok famous. I just have been on it for one week and I accidentally uh, <laughs> got 3.6 million views on one video. Um, it's kind of wild, uh, but on TikTok, I'm putting a lot of videos about 
accessibility and the, the accessible face masks that I've been making because that's when that's what I've been focusing on most. I've been making face masks with the clear window panels for uh, deaf and hard of hearing folks slash also people who might not speak the same language as you uh, as as their first language and working with children, et cetera. Um, and also they all have like different attachment styles. Uh, so there's magnets, snaps, Velcro, the ties, the ear loops. Um, I'm also trying to come up with one that you can put on without the use of your hands at all, just um, just by putting it on like your bed or something. So uh, yeah, sorry, that was long. <laughs> Not at all, thank you, thank you for sharing. I, I, I am gonna turn it back over to Emily so she can get to the questions and answers that some of the audience are, are chomping at the bit to hear. And uh, I will say that this has been an honor to, uh, to be with both of you, Sky and Alice. I thank you very much and uh, I really appreciate your work and I appreciate your willingness to share your, your power with me and the rest of us. Thank you so much. Emily. Hi, everyone. This is actually Lisa. Lisa. Surprise, get it. <laughs> it's not Emily, but Lisa Rifkin. And the first question from the audience, and thank you all so much for, uh, for submitting questions, is in your opinion, what's the next step to create equity for persons with disabilities and elevate their voices, you know, whether that be politically, socially, et cetera? Is that for Dave Fraser? Uh, this is Lisa. I think it can be answered by any and all of you. So I think whoever wants to jump in first, please do. Just out to first, uh, this is Alice. Uh, uh, I think uh, I've been thinking a lot about you know this idea of power or equity, but I think for me, uh, I'm much more interested in justice. You know, I think I wrote in my introduction that, you know, representation is important, but it's not enough. And that's because I want to see systemic change. And, you know, I do believe that shifting the culture is a huge factor in making that happen. So I think to answer the question, you know, I think people need to, I think everybody has the capacity to, to get involved and be, to really embrace like their interests and passions. Because this guy is so into design and clothing, I think, you know, for people to really kind of to ask themselves, like, what do I care about? Like, you know, what do, what's important to me in my life? I think that's how we get to, to these larger, you know, goals toward equity, is to really delve into who we are and kind of figure out what our purpose is and also what we want to do with our time on this planet. And, you know, for me, the work that I create is Kind of my way of building the future world that I want, you know, for all of us. And that means it's a place where everyone is free, everyone has inherent worth, and everyone recognizes their interdependence with one another. And I think uh, just for my own kind of growth and my own development as a person, disability justice has taught me a lot about liberation and justice. And that's, you know, equity is part of that. But I think, uh, you know, for me, it is about liberation and justice. And Patty Bird, who is one of the contributors to this anthology, who has a fantastic piece about climate change, she's one of the key people who developed the disability justice framework and I really want to give her a shout out and if you want to learn more you should definitely buy her disability justice primer which is titled Skin, Tooth and Bone 
the bases of movement is our people. And I'm going to put this in the chat box right now, but that's my response. And I thank you for your question. Yeah, I would, I, this is Sky speaking. I would agree with Alice, like, you know, my Philippine grandmother growing up wanted me to be a doctor always. And, you know, I, I really pushed against that. And uh, even though I think if I was a doctor, I could try to work on that kind of systemic change, but I would absolutely hate it and have, you know, I would be so scared all the time. So, uh, and have, it would be like way too much pressure on, on me to be a doctor. So I, you know, that's why I, I delved into my artwork and my design, because I think that that's where I can create the most change and do the most good because it's what I have the most energy to do um, and what kind of can keep me going. And I, um, yeah, so that's, that's what. This is Risa. Thank you for uh, answering the first question. I have another question here. Of 2020 has been presented with so many opportunities to be united and grow in allyship. As a non-disabled peer, what can I do to amplify the narrative shared? What are some best practices? And again, this is open to uh, anyone who wants to jump in. Uh, this is Alice, I guess. Uh, you know, I would definitely, uh, I'm really glad that there are people who are not disabled who want to be allies. And I think, you know, being an ally to me is really about being in solidarity with other disabled people and, you know, not to expect that solidarity and allyship to be, you know, transactional, like, you know, we should care about Black Lives Matter because Black Lives Matter. Not because of what Black culture and Black community has done for us. You know, I think that's really an important thing that we should think about whenever we want to be comrades, co-conspirators, accomplices with other communities. So, I think that's the first thing that comes to my mind when not disabled people ask me, oh, how can I be a good ally? I'm like, well, you can show up for us and number one, believe what we say, what we say, XYZ is super problematic. I think one of the things that a lot of people, uh, disabled people are very truthful about their lives, they're often not believed or uh, dismissed by not disabled people. And I think that's one of the most harmful effects of ableism. You know, it's this sense of like, oh, you know, oh, really? Like, seriously? Like, or are you kind of exaggerating? Uh, for example, I think disabled people have said very early on during this coronavirus pandemic, it's like, you know, we are, this is an all out kind of genocide and, you know, attempt at eugenics because what it's clearly showed is that black, brown, indigenous, disabled, older people are considered disposable. And there's still a lot of people who are like, oh, but let's reopen the economy. I just, you know, this is only affecting you know, to be high risk people, like this is, you know, everybody else is going to be fine. Well, you know, but you are okay with those kind of attitudes. You're okay with genocide. And I think that's, you know, something that's really important is to listen and learn and have some humility about what you know and don't know. And I acknowledge that. I have personally a lot of work to do myself, like there's no such thing as a perfect person in terms of being quote-unquote woke and uh, you know, I'm using that word with a little bit of side-eye and uh, 
you know, I think that other ways is country actions is to support our work, to support works like Sky, uh, to support this organization in A25, to advance your leadership, uh, to pass the mic, you know, if there's an event that your organization or workplace is having on diversity and inclusion, and you notice there's no disabled people in it, you have an obligation to say, hey, uh, something's missing here, and uh, you should actually get a disabled person to speak on this versus an advocate for us, not by us. And there's been a really long history of people speaking for us on our behalf. So I really hope that allies center disabled people did anything about disability and also, just to be frank, pay us for our expertise. You know, we're not here to give free education, to hire us as your staff, as consultants, as your speakers, because we're not here for the crumbs. We're not here for exposure. Uh, you have to you have to value us for our talents and our skills and. If I may be so bold, I will say, uh, to do suggest this book and listen to my podcast. It's on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and other uh, disabled podcasts out there. So just to participate, learn from a consumer media, and open your purse if you've got the beats. I just actually, this is Sky. I just uh, bought the audio book of Disability Visibility today so that I could listen to it while I work as well. Um, I, I love reading books, but I don't usually get the chance to sit down because I am almost always working pretty much if I'm not sleeping. So, uh, so that, but I highly recommend the audio book. Um, Alice reads her own introduction and I, almost started crying because it was just so exciting to me <laughs> like I was like this is the best thing <laughs> that has ever happened <laughs> like I I truly believe that Alice Wong is a, a national treasure <laughs> you are you are <laughs> I, I had the same experience with the audiobook I completely agree with you yes hey, this is Alice could I, if I could just jump in about the audiobook what fact the narrator, Alejandra Aspira, is a disabled person. And I'm really proud of the fact that the audiobook is by a disabled person. And for those of you who do watch audiobooks and listen to it, I feel like it really makes a difference because I feel like in the way that she, or in a, intonation, she gets it. And I think that is why, you know, one of the things important to me with this book is to, to spread the love and also the real material opportunities to, to other disabled people. Because this is not just about me, please. This is not about me. I, I do want to say that on my website, I also have a play language summary that's free for any person who doesn't can't afford the book or need a play language summary by a disabled writer, Sarah Luchman. And there's also a free discussion guide by a disabled writer, Naomi Ortiz. So I really hope there's a lot of resources that non-disabled folks and disabled folks could use to do really spark conversation and reflection about this book and just let this be a springboard to dive in more and just, you know, splash around. 
This is Lisa. Thank you so much for those answers. I'm going to try and squeeze in two questions to wrap us up, after which Emily will come back on for some closing remarks. So there are two very different questions, but would love your thoughts on them. The first question is, how do you navigate the potential safety risks of living as your full self? This is from a trans, mad, fat, disabled person. The last question to uh, bring us home, if you will, is how do you channel joy in the face of so much collective grief? So with that, I want to thank you and turn it over to you. Stan, did you want to go with the first question? I'll go with the second one. Okay, yeah. Um, well, so when I started being pretty radically visible at a young age, um, because I, I've always had something about my body or my look, just, just mainly based off of my style, that was uh, unusual. Uh, like when I was a child, my hair was below my butt. Um, and then in, when I was 15, I started dressing the way that I dress now, basically. Um, just maybe a little bit less, um, I mean, I made a little bit less of the stuff that I wore, but it was very colorful. Um, when I started dating my first girlfriend when I was 15, I wore cat ears. And when I first started dressing in this way um, and being very outwardly queer on the street, I would get a lot of comments. And um, I would sometimes get grabbed by creepy guys uh, physically. Um, and like on the, the CTA, the, the Chicago Transit here, I, I would also sometimes get grabbed. But then uh, I started wearing this makeup that looks like a tattoo, and that actually was a way to make myself more radically visible, but also kind of act like a, a you know, a poison frog, where it's, like, beautiful, but you want to stay away from it, because everybody was like, oh my god, you have a face tattoo, uh, I, you must be tough, uh, even though I'm, I'm very small, I'm, like, uh, five foot one and a half, um, and like petite, uh, so I, you know, people can physically pick me up very easily and, and would sometimes do that, but having, having tattoos, having this makeup that looks like a fat face tattoo has helped me um, kind of create a sense of arm, oh, yeah, safety and armor and like, you know, actually wearing literal armor. And so, that, that has helped me um, be radically visible, but also feel a little bit safer. So, sometimes it doesn't always work, and then I have to just kind of try to s escape situations. But generally, it's been better. Um, it, it was a lot worse when I was a teenager. But I also, you know, now have cultivated the, like, kind of bitch face that, that you, like, walk down or, like, roll down Chicago looking a little bit mean so that nobody... <laughs> nobody messes with you. But then if somebody smiles at me, then I say, hi, <laughs> like, you know. <laughs> uh, this is Alice, thanks for that story. And uh, I would say, you know, finding joy is really hard, but I think, you know, I do think that now more than ever, when these times are so bleak and they seem overwhelming and they're really painful, right? You know, there's a lot of grief, there's pain, you know, thinking about what's happening, you're just with the uprisings for racial justice and just scores of people dying and being sick within this country that really is irresponsible and selfish. You know, I feel like we have to kind of be very intentional about carving that time out and making space for pleasure enjoy and I think that's hard to do that's easy to say you know everybody loves to throw out the word self-care you know self-care this self-care that you know just put on a face mask or you know get in a bubble bath or buy this thing but you know for me it's just about slowing down it's like you know I take breaks I don't want to be on all the time I I you know I feel like uh I've reached a point in my life where I do have control over my day and 
to dance with the bitches theme about autonomy again. I feel like that's been the running theme of the today's talk just about autonomy and power. I think those are really interrelated. Um, but yeah, I think um, having making the time, and I think it's a discipline, right? It's a practice. Yeah. You know, yeah. Richard, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, it's, you know, I'm just saying it's a real discipline and practice to like to care for yourself and love for yourself. And I think, so just to answer the question, I do that through eating ice cream, watching cat videos. I have these individual like direct, like direct message threads with my friends which would be really petty and just like really salty about things. It's just like having, <laughs> having that safe space to just like to say whatever I want. It's just like, can you believe this? You know, so that gives me joy. And I think, uh, you know, we all have that capacity to offer that care and love for one another. So. I guess that's my advice is to really try to be intentional about it. I think you deserve it too. Like nobody should tell you what you have to do in terms of just what's expected. And I think you really gotta be able to push back and say, no, this is what I need. You know, I need to sleep in tomorrow. Or like I need to I need to I need to nourish myself. Or I'm gonna treat myself, and I think that's we all deserve that. I mean, we should always tell each other that all the time. Well, this was certainly a treat. This is Emily Blum speaking. Uh, Alice, Sky, Derek, thank you all so much. This was really um, you brought us joy, and for those of us who attended, this this felt like self care. So, so thank you so much, Alice. Um, thank you also to all of our guests who joined us today and a big thank you to all those who donated and our Power Series sponsor and board member Anna Manikas. You help make this and our other virtual events accessible and equitable. And to our partner Chicago Public Library's Diversibility, Advocacy, LGBT Pride and the Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Committees. We thank you so much. Uh, before we conclude, uh, we have a few announcements. Our next power series is scheduled for August 25th and will feature a conversation on the census and why the disability count uh, is more important than ever. Um, there is a slide uh, that shows um, the, the event conversation called Power and Justice, a 2020 Census Conversation. Um, we hope you will join us August 25th. Um, join our network of positive disruptors. If you are a person with a disability living in the Chicago region and are interested in joining our community, visit ada25chicago.org backslash apply to become a member or a fellow in our 2021 Leadership Institute. If you'd like to continue to see Advancing Leadership produce accessible events like these, please consider contributing to our program at ada25chicago.org backslash donate. And finally, stay engaged with us. Follow us on social media, on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Medium, slide into our DMs. Um, we will be publishing this video and a recap of this event. So thank, with that, thank you and good night. We'll see you next time.